thank you for having me. And uh, I'm going with great pleasure to share with you the Rwandan experience about innovation in prevention, treatment, and care of COVID-19. My objective will be to examine with you innovation in those areas that have successfully helped us to do a, an efficient response to COVID-19. Next slide. I will start by providing an overview of the status of COVID in Rwanda. As you can see here on the right of the slide, we have so far had less than 500 cases of COVID in Rwanda. And uh, the, the data here are a little bit uh, out of date because I sent my presentation a few days ago. We have today 27 deaths since the 14 March. Does, this doesn't seem a lot, but for us it's a lot because each death like everywhere counts. But to get that low level, the country had developed and implemented various in innovation. Innovation in technology, the use of artificial intelligence tools, but also innovation in governance, the way the health system is governed in Rwanda and especially the way COVID-19 is managed. And um, I will also describe how this way to manage as provide a low level of infection and uh, prove us right. In this slide, I want first to show that one of the major innovation was the way that we systematically use implementation science principle to manage the, the pandemic in identification of our contextual factors. The barrier, we know our country and we know what to do. We know the barrier of transportation. We are locked down. Our country is in the heart of Africa. We don't, we does, doesn't have a port. Uh, we doesn't have access to the sea, to the ocean. Uh, we have, we don't have running water everywhere. We, the, this disease spread fast. We all know that. And we also, because of a big number of our fellow Rwandan that live uh, in the informal sectors to uh, sector to get money, there is a financial instability. But we have also great facilitators in our contextual factor, strong national leadership, a culture of accountability, and more than 90% of Rwanda can get access to, interfo uh, to internet. And this has changed the way the, the, the exchange among the population, no cash uh, money, just mobile money. We have also identified across the world what are the evidence-based intervention that work? And we all know it's the same everywhere. Washing hand, testing, contract tracing, stay, uh, tracing uh, isolation and quarantine, lockdown, uh, social distancing, and focus. What we do, we have focus on truth and cultivate trust. That's how everything has worked. And this slide is the second innovation is how systematically we use strategies and implementation in implementation of the evidence-based intervention we have selected. A systematic use of global data and increase national knowledge of all the strata of the population. We generate the daily data needed to manage the disease. You have seen previously the the data of the 17th of September, every day through social media, through media, we have those information. We have integrated the new knowledge we gain ourselves, but also the scientific uh, community across the world gain in the policies and guidelines. We have a continuous education of healthcare providers at all levels, but also we keep the population informed. We have a, a provision of information of the population, both what is good or what is bad. We don't let politics enter in science. We control our border, 
we have a multi-sectoral co coordination. What is very important, this is not an issue of the Minister of Health. It's an issue of the entire cabinet. And the president is also uh, helping the management and the prime minister, meaning the police, the local government, the minister of education, gender, uh, local government, they are all in. And local government play a big role, you'll see later. The pro protecting of primary care so that people can get access to care. And for this is also important. We have COVID center, yes, but people who have a sign of COVID or believe they have been in contact are not allowed to go to the hospital. There is a free, a, a number they can call for free, and an ambulance with people in PPE come and pick them, go to test, is positive, they're hospitalized. If negative, they go back home. If it's positive, the house is isolated and uh, all the surrounding houses are also tested systematically the same day. So uh, there is also a systematic equity land in all this. 40% of our population are poor. We don't forget that. If we ask people uh, to pay their test, to pay their isolation, their quarantine, they will not do it. So we cannot implement the response. So there is special provision for that. And um, the next slide show you the third innovation in the contact tracing system. Uh, uh, we do, uh, the community health workers and young volunteers, you know, we have stopped the, uh, the, the majority of high uh, education institutions are stopped, but the students are volunteers across the country to mobilize people for contact tracing, for washing their hands. Uh, there is, uh, when there is uh, um, uh, the confirmed infection are being traced through a paperless system through open data kit, it's an application. COVID-19 digital surveillance system uh, is used to track also influenza-like illness and severe acute respiratory infection to make sure that the test uh, for the pandemic is done. We also do contact tracing across border to, to be able to continue the trade. We told you we are uh, surrounding by Congo, Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi. So we need to uh, make sure that trade continue for, for the population of all the zone in Rwanda and surrounding. All trucks have a GPS. It's new with COVID. Uh, they are tracked and um, to be allowed to enter in Rwanda or to go out from Rwanda. There is also an East African Community Regional Electronic Cargo and Driver Tracking System. More than 4,000 truck drivers have registered and it allows the partner states, our neighbors, to electronically share the COVID-19 results and take action together. The next innovation is the contact tracing system to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, for the testing. Uh, there is random and everyday testing in the major cities and also in communities. It's randomly, but this pool testing. So that means if the pool test uh, is positive, then we call one by one all those who have been uh, tested. So that means it, it, it helps us to gain time because we pull the test for 100 people, for example. If it's positive, then we call those 100 people and we test them uh, separately. It is important because uh, we have a very low rate of infection and doing so, we have rapidly the result of where we should pay attention. We have a early detection and prevention. We use robots. You can see in this picture a robot in the airport who tests the temperature without touching the people. It allows us to do more. We don't have a lot of personnel. It has helped us in that. But in a hospital, those robots take the temperature of the patient and it allows the health workers to do something else, but also to avoid four times a day going take the temperature and avoid four times the risk to be infected. infected. Uh, 
It happened in public uh, buildings, in hospitals, and you cannot enter in any public hospital, uh, sorry, any public um, building without washing your hands and uh, uh, without being checked for your temperature. Uh, we also use uh, drones, drones for messaging, drone to see what happened in an area, but also drone to deliver goods and system. And uh, they can cross the, uh, doing that, they can bring goods from the capital city to the community uh, to care about the people. It was already used before, but now it's used more because with COVID, we, there is less movement of people across the country. Um, the next slide is to show you that those innovation exist, but with, uh, we have a low GDP per capita, 826 according to the World Bank. And if we uh, don't take care about the level of poverty, nobody will, of half of the population will not comply. So we need an equity agenda and we have an equity agenda. Every innovation, we think about it, how inclusively the vulnerable will benefit of it and how it will reach the hard to reach, the last mile, the last part of the country, how it will be available, acceptable, accessible, and for quality for all, for those who can afford and those who cannot afford. And uh, also we have a community health insurance, 90% of our people have uh, have this insurance where they pay only 10% at point of care of the cost of care. And it's $5 for the average rundown, $12 for the people who have uh, a good salary and zero, the premium and the point of care is zero for all the people who uh, are uh, vulnerable. And this is 25% of our population. Each dollar invested in the most vulnerable people have a high return. We know that there is study. Uh, all the countries know that they should apply that and they will have the same type of result and solid health sector as we have. We have improved uh, geographic ac access with the decentralization. Uh, we have also uh, tr tr make everything sustainable. All those new guidelines and policies are embedded in the legal framework of Rwanda and help us to be prepared next time. We have also a distribution of food systematically. When I say that the local government is uh, important, there is no, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there is 200 houses have a chief of village. I have one living near here. And this chief of village that we elected is in charge to signal all the vulnerable who may not eat every day. And there is a budget to bring them food. And doing so, people have no big burden to, to, to apply the guidelines and to follow the rules. And there is a financial assistance for the most vulnerable who have no longer income uh, because they are in the informal sector and they have to work today to eat tomorrow. Like, to 20,000 households in Kigali refuse or uh, refuse, uh, receive food and support uh, every day. And uh, this was very important, especially in the strict lo lockdown. Now the life has, uh, is going on like before, uh, except that only 50% of the Rwanda are working every day, but there is, there is a rotation so that if I work today, uh, tomorrow I will let somebody else working. But there is a sh uh, challenge. There is misinformation in, um, in, um, in the world. Mm? Uh, thanks God, there is a study done by Wellcome Trust showing that Rwanda is the country where the, health, the population has the biggest trust in the health sector. There is a shortage of skilled personnel that uh, can use uh, artificial intelligence, we need to work with partners to increase the number of people who can uh, do that. And we need to work to continue to implement all this to be ready for the next uh, pandemic. And this is why the University of Global Health Equity has been created to teach that to um, the, the next generation of people who will manage uncertainty, and 
a predictable threat like COVID because we don't know what tomorrow is done of. So the University of Global Health Equity is in Rwanda and uh, has, I don't know how many times um, I still have, but uh, it's in the rural north, uh, inside the community, and we, our students live and work in rural Rwanda exactly with the, pro the type of population they will serve when they will be graduated. We teach them leadership because that is really lacking in all uh, education we receive. We, we have a gender uh, approach. We have uh, also, for the next, 70% uh, of our, uh, the people or the young people uh, we, look, uh, we select to uh, be in medical education are girls. To, it's a statement to gender equity because if the majority of people in global health are women, only 25% are in leadership training. For the rest, I advise you to visit our web.